What is baptism? I'm Darwin Wallace, and this is Theology 102 at Mission U. And in this section of our course, we will be answering the question, what is baptism? I was baptized when I was six years old. My family had just joined a new church after moving when one night the pastor came over to have a chat. After he left, alone in my room that night, I decided hmm, I should probably get baptized. I didn't know what baptism was. I don't think I had ever maybe even seen one. I wasn't totally clear on why I should do it. But, you know, it, it sounded like what a person should do that doesn't want to end up in the bad place for eternity. Yeah, quite a thought for a little six-year-old boy. A few weeks later, I found myself in a little room at the back of the church building, slipping into a plasticky white robe that had seen hmm, a few generations of views. As I climbed down the stairs, my, my mind was focused on not tripping over the robe that had been made for someone three times my size. As I dipped my foot into the water of the baptismal, it felt way too cold to get in, but, you know, I had already come this far. So I stepped down into the porcelain tub that was nearly as white as the pastor's hair. The robe immediately floated to the surface of the water, and my, my little self seized with embarrassment. I was too short to see over the edge of the tub, but as I got on my tiptoes, I, I was first relieved to see my parents, but after my shy little self saw the hundreds of onlookers, I sank back down into the tub to hide. The pastor clasped my head and, and hands, told the congregation who I was, asked me a few questions that were a blur in my mind, and dunked me into the cold bath water. I was baptized. Baptism is one of the two rites or ordinances or sacraments of the church required in the New Testament. Every church must participate in the practice of baptism. However, across the denominations, across places, across times, baptism has looked incredibly different. Now, this raises a number of questions in our theology of baptism, with such diverse opinions on what baptism means and how to do it, we need to go right to Scripture with our questions about baptism. So, we will be approaching this class by asking the Bible nine different questions about baptism. Our first question is this, where in scripture do we see baptism instituted? Well, after his resurrection and just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus was standing with his disciples. Now, these were his last moments with the people he had entrusted to spread the gospel, the last instructions that he was going to give to his closest followers before ascending into heaven the last words he would speak as a human on this earth. These words counted. And this is what he said. Matthew 28, 17 to 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. These words propelled Jesus' disciples into their ministry. Soon, they found themselves in Jerusalem on Pentecost, with Peter preaching Jesus' gospel to a huge crowd. The Holy Spirit moved, the church was born that day, and Thousands of people responded to the gospel message. They asked the disciples what in the world they should do now that they believe. And this was Peter's response. Acts 2 verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent and be baptized. Sandwiched between faith and forgiveness in the two bedrock passages of the first Christians is this idea of baptism. Both in the Great Commission and the first Christian sermon, we are told to be baptized. 
These two foundational passages make it clear that for those of us who believe in Jesus, baptism is an absolutely essential, important, pivotal act. Our second question is, what does baptism accomplish? Well, there are a a number of aspects that baptism accomplishes in our life. First, as, as we just read, baptism represents... Repentance. It represents repentance. Acts 2, 38. Repent, (laughs) repent, and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized. A shocking number of biblical passages about baptism tie it directly to repentance. After a person repents and turns to God, they are baptized to represent this the, the, the act of baptism, then, is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. Second, baptism also incorporates us into the church. Ephesians 4, verses 4 to verse 5 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So baptism acts as a tangible initiation into the community of the local church, where we are united as one with God's people. Here you can almost think of baptism like an initiation rite. Third, baptism is also an experience of Christ's redemptive work, an experience of Christ's redemptive work. Colossians 2.12 tells us this, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So in baptism, we are able to glimpse the experience of Christ's death and resurrection and the salvation it brings us. The experience of being dipped into the water acts as a symbol of the washing away of sin. Fourth, baptism is also an act of obedience. Matthew 28, 19 tells us, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, to obey everything I have commanded you. Christ commanded us to be baptized. When we put our faith in him, often baptism is our very first act of obedience and submission to Jesus. We cannot be obedient followers of Jesus while simultaneously delaying, unnecessarily delaying baptism. Fifth, Baptism is also a public declaration of faith. Acts 8.12 But when they believed, Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Baptism is a way for us to testify about our faith to other people. This is why we always do baptisms as a part of a church gathering instead of a, a small private event. Baptism is not just an individual event. We are actually publicly declaring our faith for other people to see. Sixth, baptism is also a way we identify the transition to our new life. Romans 6, 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life life. We too may live a new life. We all learn better with visual aids. Just as as Jesus was buried and rose from the grave, the act of being lowered into the water to stand again gives us a visual aid and an event that we can look back on to, to signify the beginning of our new life in Christ. It helps us identify this moment when we transitioned into our new spiritual life. And then seventh, Baptism is also based on that Romans 6, 4 verse, a way we mysteriously are joined with or made one with Christ. So these are just some of uh, of the things that scripture tells us about baptism and what it accomplishes. This is what baptism accomplishes. Then our third question is, where did the idea of baptism start? John the Baptist was performing baptisms in Matthew 3 before Jesus instituted baptism for his followers. So where did this idea really start? Well, it started with a Jewish 
purity ritual named mikvah. A person going through a mikvah would be immersed in naturally flowing water. Mikvah is a sign of, of washing away impurities and becoming pure. And archaeologists have found ancient ruins of mikvah baths that, that predate Jesus' birth. So it appears that Jesus borrowed this ceremony of water immersion and he reshaped it. The word baptism that is used in our New Testament is, is the Greek word baptizo, which means to plunge or dip or immerse. So that's where the, the history of baptism really started. Our fourth question then is what is the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance? As you talk about communion and baptism in different churches, you're going to hear them referred to with these two terms. So it's important for you to, to know the difference between them. You may hear some churches like the Roman Catholic Church, refer to baptism and communion as sacraments. Sacraments. This means that baptism, communion, and for them, five other sacraments are the vehicles of grace that are necessary for salvation that Jesus instituted. Then you may hear other churches refer to baptism and communion as ordinances, ordinances. This means that baptism and communion are symbols or visual aids uh, Jesus instituted that are, that are vital to obedience and spiritual growth, but are not necessary for salvation. They're not vehicles of grace, which is what scripture would point us towards. Our fifth question then about baptism is, how should we be baptized? How? Meaning, what are the, the, the different practical modes different churches use to baptize people. Well, the, the first mode of baptism is immersion. In this mode, a person's body goes beneath the surface of the water as they're baptized. Within this view, there are actually still less significant questions. Like, while it seems that the, the baptisms that were being done in the New Testament were total immersions, it seems that way, is it okay for a person only to be partially submerged? And then would it be more accurate to do immersion baptism in living water, like a river or a lake, instead of, you know, a tub or a pool or a hot tub, to, so you could be closer to that background of mikvah? I, I even have a friend who traveled all the way to Israel to be immersed in the Jordan River, right? Eastern Orthodox baptism actually includes three full submersions or immersions into the baptism water to symbolize the Trinity. And the, the denomination that is best known for this method of immersion is, well, you probably guessed, it's the Baptists <laughs> and uh, all of those denominations in the Anabaptist tradition. The second method of baptism is pouring. Here, water is actually poured over the person's head. Its technical name is effusion, Latin for to pour on. This is the method the, the Roman Catholic Church and a few Protestant churches like the Mennonites use. The, the third method of baptism is sprinkling, where the person is baptized by water being, being sprinkled, usually on their head. The technical name for this is aspersion. Some Presbyterians utilize this method. So those are, are the three main ways of how we can do baptism. But in the end, the question of method is not really as important as it might seem to some people. The Didache, the Didache is a document that we have from the, the early church, and it's like a catechism or handbook from the late first century, and, and included this statement about baptism. Baptize this way. Having first said all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. But if you have no living water, baptize in into other water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, do so in warm. But if you, you have neither, pour out water three times upon the head into the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
So yes, being immersed in living water, like a river or lake, is closer to the mode that was used by the very earliest Christians. It's what they normally did. Immersion was always their goal. But there is room for other different methods. If you don't have living water, uh, you could use regular water. If you can't immerse, you can pour, right? It says that. So even though some methods are closer to what we see in Scripture, that does not mean that other ways of doing baptisms make them invalid. So no matter which method you use, uh, we, we recognize that how a person is baptized is of minuscule importance compared to whether they're baptized. The sixth question we have about baptism then is, what about infant baptism? This is the stickiest question, right? And there are really three main views here. The first main view is the believer's baptism view, that only people who personally, consciously put their faith in Jesus are to be baptized. Now, this is often the view of Baptists or Congregationalists or non-denominational evangelical churches. The second main view is infant baptism as ordinance. This view states that when infants are baptized, it does not provide salvation, but it's their introduction into the community into the people, and into the church of Jesus' followers. This view developed primarily during the Reformation in the 16th century. It is often the view of Lutherans and often the view of Presbyterians. And then the third view, of uh, the main view of infant baptism, is infant baptism as sacrament. This view believes that salvation is received by the infant when they're baptized. Augustine introduced this idea in the early 400s AD. This is the view of the Roman Catholic Church. So, which one is correct? Well, that's going to be part of your assignment for this section of the course. So, I am not going to actually weigh in on that. But, just to kind of rile you up, before you explore the question on your own, let me put out a few of the arguments just for fun. Just to be argumentative, okay? Someone who supports believer's baptism would argue, stating that there is no evidence anywhere in Scripture of infants being baptized, and that instead, baptism occurs after a person comes to real conscious faith, and we see this throughout the New Testament. But someone who supports infant baptism would argue, stating that infant baptism was the norm starting in the 4th century AD and for about 1,200 years thereafter. But then someone who, you know, supports believers' baptism would argue against infant baptism by, you know, bringing up the theologies of of repentance and conversion, how that just is not possible with infants. But someone who then supports infant baptism would argue that that if you only believe in believer's baptism, you have to answer questions like, what do you do with the theology of original sin? Um, then how old is someone when they reach an age of accountability, the age that someone could, could actually make that decision of conscious faith? So yeah, this has been a, an explosive topic in the church. It's been explosive throughout church history. The seventh question is, is baptism a requirement for salvation? Well, this seems to have a clear biblical answer, right? Uh, Romans 3.28, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Justified by faith. We are not justified. We are not saved based on our works, on anything we do. And that has to include baptism. Ephesians 2.8, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of of God, not from yourself. It's clear we are saved the moment we place our faith in Jesus. There is nothing we must do to find salvation, not even being baptized. And a specific story from the Gospels really supports this. At Golgotha, Jesus was hanging on, on a cross, and there's, there's two criminals to his sides. One of them realizes he deserves his punishment, while Jesus does not. 
So that criminal turns to Jesus and he says this in Luke 23, 42 to 43. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So this man decides to have faith in Jesus and Jesus affirms that right in that moment, he is saved. The man has no possibility to be baptized. He's literally dying. So from scripture, we see that no, baptism is not a requirement for salvation. But from there, we do need to recognize that there is some real complexity and some nuance in how scripture discusses the importance of baptism. In scripture, baptism is consistently part of the redemption package. This does not mean that baptism is necessary for salvation, but that the norm in the stories and the instructions that we receive in Scripture is to repent, have faith, then be baptized. So many times in the New Testament, we see someone put their faith in Jesus, and the very next thing we see them do is they're, they're baptized. For example, in Acts 2, after the people in Jerusalem respond to Peter's first sermon, asking him what they must do, he tells them this in Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent and be baptized. So baptism becomes part of this redemptive package. It is just assumed that after you have faith, you will be baptized. It, it, it just goes together in the story. We even see this in Paul's story. As he recounts meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul says that after he had faith in Christ, God told him to go and see a man named Ananias. And Ananias told Paul this in Acts 22 verse 16, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. The message is really clear. What in the world are you waiting for? What are you waiting for to be baptized? So in scripture, a believer choosing not to be baptized is just, it's, it's something that does not make sense. Baptism is not theoretically necessary, theologically necessary for salvation, but practically the two just they just go together as the same package. It is not for us to judge, but if a, a person claims to know Jesus while also disobeying his command to be baptized and disregarding his church by refusing its initiating right, it is possible that that person just does not fully comprehend faith in Jesus Christ in the first place. So no, baptism is not necessary for salvation. But we, we need to take it in a way more serious fashion than some optional add-on to faith. The eighth question, then, is who can perform baptisms? With some churches, like the Roman Catholic Church, the belief is that only an ordained priest can perform a baptism. But we do not see any restrictions in Scripture on who can perform baptisms, other than, of course, they must be fathers of Jesus Christ, right? However, the best practice is that a pastor or elder or other church leader of an, a local church would perform the baptism. This is because baptism is so connected with becoming part of the community of the local church of Jesus. Then the ninth question is, what words do we use? As we perform baptisms in our churches, there are a number of liturgies, a number of sets of words we can use, things we can say. For example, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churchgoers have a, a longer, detailed liturgy of the readings and words that the priest uses while baptizing the person. While many Protestant churches are much more casual about this. However, Jesus does, does give us an idea of what we must include as we perform baptism. Matthew 28, 18 to 19 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything 
I have commanded you. So just looking at, at only this passage, as we perform baptisms, there are at least three essentials that really should be mentioned during the baptism. During the baptism, we need to verbally confirm the faith of the person being baptized, that they really are a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is often done by asking a question that begins with something like, do you believe? Then we certainly need to mention the Trinity. This often sounds like the pastor saying, I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we need to make mention of, of this transition where we are identifying that the person is going from their old life to a new life in Christ and obeying what, what Jesus has commanded them. You might hear this mentioned with words like buried to the old life, raised again to walk with him in the new. So there it is. That is our introduction to baptism. My hope is that we answered your biggest questions about baptism and developed a clear theology of baptism in your mind. But my bigger hope is not just that you grew in your knowledge, but that that if you have been baptized, that, that right now you'd be able to look back at your baptism with more understanding and more gratitude and more joy. And that if you've not yet been baptized, that you would do so. Thank you for watching Theology 102 at Mission 